Oh my fucking god, dude! <clears throat> Hello, you absolute legends. What you just saw is one of the most magical moments in speedrunning history. The runner, Narcissa Wright, was on pace to perform what would likely be the greatest speedrun of all time. After successfully executing a wrong warp from the game's first dungeon to the final sequence, there was just one more obstacle to overcome before reaching the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time's climactic boss fight. But this hurdle would be the toughest yet, an extremely precise strategy known as the Void Warp. Everything in the run builds up to this one moment, and if a player manages to pull off this final skip, it's essentially smooth sailing. The fight with Ganon, which immediately follows, is a relatively easy one. When it came to Ocarina of Time speedruns, the Void Warp was always the most tense and most exciting moment. It's here that runs either ended or made history. The Void Warp is iconic, and the reactions from the elite group of gamers that managed to do it while on record pace will always stay with me. If you wanted to script a speedrun to produce maximum hype, you really couldn't do it any better. Over the past 10 years, the Void Warp had been a staple of high-level Zelda speedruns, but as of this moment, the Void Warp is officially dead. In July of 2022, the Zelda speedrunning community was shocked when the player Lozuts smashed the world record with a brand new strategy that completely skipped the dreaded Void Warp. Not only is this new strategy pretty interesting in its own right, but it also marks the end of an era of one of the most famous tricks in speedrunning history. In order to honor the passing of this great technique, we are going to revisit the history of the Void Warp and learn why it was so special. And of course, we will also learn about this new strategy that is not only faster, but is much easier as well. I really hope you enjoy. Now Legends, did you know that according to a recent study, Raid Shadow Legends is the greatest video game ever made? This isn't just me saying that because they are sponsoring this video either. This is coming from real scientists wearing real lab coats. I mean, you can't fake that. Can you name one other game that allows you to collect and build up champions with unique skills and hundreds of artifacts? Yeah, I didn't think so. Here's my three favorite champions. Number one, Lydia. She debuffs the entire enemy team and buffs my team with strength and speed. Number two, Arbiter. She has the ability to revive every single dead champion. And three, Masha Led. He places Fear and Leech on the enemy team, which both prevents them from taking action, and heals my team when they deal damage. Recently, Raid has launched the Forge Pass Season 3, with heaps of rewards on offer, including a limited edition artifact set. Raid is also releasing new champions and some pretty sweet skins for Madame Ceres. Also, Raid just released a legendary version of the game's cutest little common champion, called the Ultimate Death Knight, which you can get for free just by logging in for seven days before October 27. Then just use the DK Rises promo code and you'll get a bunch of free items to instantly get him to level 50. Here is what you need to do. Click my link in the description or scan my QR code on screen and you'll get bonuses worth $30. That's a free epic champion Aina, 200k silver, one energy refill, one XP boost, and one ancient shard to summon an awesome champion as soon as you start. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. So what exactly is the Void Warp? Well, in order to know, we need to put it into context. To beat Ocarina of Time, we need to defeat the game's antagonist, Ganondorf. The encounter takes place at the very top of his castle, but once Ganondorf is overcome, he uses his remaining strength to bring the castle down, with Link and Zelda still inside. This creates a race against the clock, where we need to reach the bottom and escape the falling debris before we are entombed in the collapsing rubble. This descent ends up taking a few minutes for several reasons. First, the way down is blocked by locked doors that only Zelda can open, so we are capped at how fast she can make her way down. Secondly, at one point Zelda becomes enshrined in fire and can only be released after killing two Stalfos. And of course, we have to consider the time it takes to literally run down the tower. Once we finally reach the bottom floor and make our way out, the entire castle collapses into itself, and the assumption is that Ganondorf, still incapacitated, was crushed within. However, the battle is not over. As Ganondorf springs from the rubble and uses the Triforce of Power to turn into Ganon, the game's true final boss. Once Ganon is defeated, the end credits play, and the game is over. 
In 2012, the discovery of wrong warping completely changed the face of Zelda speedrunning, and in April of that same year, the strategy of warping from the first dungeon to Ganon's castle and at the end of the game was first performed. This is the strategy that most people probably would have seen before. Aside from skipping everything else in the game, this warp also skips the first battle with Ganondorf and leaves us at the top of the castle immediately after his first defeat. This is where the tower begins to collapse and we need to make our way down to the bottom. At this point in history, this descent was still done conventionally. But in June of 2013, an interesting strategy was devised by the glitch hunter, Glitches and Stuff, that allowed them to get all the way to the bottom of the castle immediately from the very top. The original video was pretty whack, and it was certainly not something that could be performed by a human, but it was very cool nonetheless. I won't go too in-depth into the underlying mechanics, but in order for this trick to work, they needed to first activate what's known as the Infinite Sword Glitch. When this glitch is active and Link uses his shield to prevent damage, it retains his height, even if he's in mid-air. You'll see people use this mechanic all over the place with bombs and backflips to hover into the air and gain height. In this particular instance, glitches and stuff was using falling boulders instead of bombs. But these boulders are random and you don't see them falling which makes this particular strategy only possible with tools. In any case, they used the boulders to hover and slowly make their way towards a doorway into the castle on a lower platform. When they are close enough, they jump into the loading zone that relates to that door. There's a bit more to this story though, as during this collapse sequence, if you jump off a ledge and fall a certain distance, the game will void you out and place you back where you last entered that area. This gets a little bit weird, because after the wrong warp, you entered the area through a room within the castle, as that's where you warped to. But because it was your first time being outside the castle, it placed you at the very top and started the collapse sequence. However, it still remembers that you entered the area through a lower room, and that's the coordinates it uses to put you back after the void. If you hit a loading zone to get into the castle at the same time as voiding out, the game will load the map for inside of the castle, but still place you at the coordinates which relate to the outside of the castle. This is why Link will spawn way up high and start falling. This also conveniently allows him to skip the rest of the castle and to land near the exit. Looking at this picture, the original concept for this new void warp had Link jumping off the ledge around here and circling around behind the tower to a door on the opposite side. But almost immediately, glitches and stuff found a much easier way. Albeit still impossible for a human as it used boulders, but much less work would be involved. The new method would have Link jump from this railing here and fall down into the loading zone just below. The second video by Glitches and Stuff was promising, and if there were a way to get over the railing and drop down, it seemed like it was a real possibility. But the railing can't be jumped over, and Link doesn't have any bombs to do a hover, so getting over the railing wasn't feasible. But maybe there was a way to get through it instead of over it. Ocarina of Time is an incredibly broken game when it comes to glitches, and it just so happened that there was a mechanic that might be of use. It's called an Acute Angle Clip. The Acute Angle Clip takes advantage of the way collision detection works with walls, and as the name suggests, it works with corners with angles of less than 90 degrees. Each frame, the game will check Link's current position, and if he is going to end up too close to a wall, or even past it, it will push him back inside. When we actually play the game, it feels like walls are just some solid barrier we can't penetrate, and it's quite seamless. But internally, there is a constant battle between Link getting within the wall's personal space and the wall pushing him away. An important quirk about this mechanic, however, is that it would not activate again if the resulting push away from a wall lands Link too close to another wall. If this did happen, it might be possible for Link to get stuck in between two walls, forever bouncing back and forth. So in order to prevent this, it can't push Link away more than once in a row. We can take advantage of this by using the push from one wall to get Link past a different wall. This can be achieved by activating a wall collision right on the edge of a corner as long as it's less than 90 degrees. Because of this acute angle, the push will land Link beyond the opposite wall. 
Obviously, the precision required is quite high, and this demonstration is purely just to give you an idea about how it works. In practice, it requires a lot of speed to enable Link to get close enough into a corner so that the distance he needs to travel to get past the other wall is as short as possible. Generally, you can get enough speed just by jump slashing, and this was the first way people took advantage of this clip. It's been known about and used for well over a decade. The reason jump slashes work is because at the end of Link's animation, his coordinate jerks forward a large distance in a single frame. It's masked by the animation itself, but as far as the collision detection is concerned, it's significant enough to cause this clip. By slowing down an example of the clip, you can easily see the frame in which the wall pushes Link out of bounds. The corner of the potential void wall location is an acute angle, so in theory a clip here should work. But using a jump slash is out of the question, as when there is no solid ground or water beyond the walls of a corner, a jump slash will never allow Link to clip through. This is because when Link's sword is active, the game won't push him off a ledge. And as it turns out, on the other side of this corner is just a void, so that won't work. In order to clip through, we need another way to get enough speed, and again, luckily, we do have a way. It's called a hyperextended super slide, or HESS for short, and this is where the boulders actually come in handy. The HESS was originally found in 2012 by using bombs, but the falling boulders basically act the same way for the purposes of this trick. To begin the slide, the player needs to roll into the boulder as it lands, and because it's landing on solid ground, we can now use the shadow to know where that will be. For most of the roll, Link has invincibility frames, but towards the end of the roll, he will stand up and take damage. At the same time he takes damage, if the player holds Z and R and tilts the control stick slightly to the left or right, Link will begin sliding backwards. The angle the stick needs to be held is pretty precise, and ultimately, that's what makes the Hess a reasonably difficult trick to master. The slide gives us enough speed, but we have another problem we need to overcome, which is hitting the corner at the correct angle. This is by far the most difficult part, and because of the precision required, we would need some kind of setup in order to do it consistently. This is where the Glitch Hunter sock folder comes in. Sock Folder is arguably the most famous setup finder in the history of speedrunning. Not only have they found setups for some of the most useful tricks in Zelda, but they have also found some critical setups in a ton of games, including those in the Mario series, such as the consistent way to perform Cannonless in Super Mario 64, and a consistent way to perform the flagpole glitch in Super Mario Bros. Two weeks after the initial Void Warp concept was published by Glitches and Stuff, Sock Folder had already found a set up to get the correct angle using a HESS. To get the angle, he would target and untarget Zelda at specific times, using the arrows circling her head to know which frame to perform certain actions. This allows the player to consistently get the correct angle and facilitate the clip, and thus the error of the void warp began. This was huge. At the time, the world record stood at just over 21 minutes, and this new skip saved around 2 minutes. By the end of 2013, the record had gone from 2106 to 1905. The setup created by Sock Folder was consistent, and obviously the Void Warp saved a lot of time, but theoretically, it wasn't optimal. The setup required you to wait at the bottom of the ramp for Zelda to arrive. Then, the multiple pauses slowed things down dramatically as well. Technically, you didn't need to do any of this. The actual odds of hitting the correct angle was 8% if you just went for it with no setup. These odds aren't consistent, but if you did pull it off, it was so much faster. You could even start the slide from the very top of the ramp, and in March of 2014, that's exactly what Narcissa Wright did. Oh my god, it happened. That is insane. <laughs> it fucking happened. 8% chance of that clip. <laughs> Unbelievable.
From here, there was no going back. This method of sliding from the top and clipping through without a setup is called InstaClip, and it would become the most notorious strategy in the run. InstaClip started off as a terrible, inconsistent strategy, but not too long after it began being implemented into world record runs, the runner Skater devised a setup that made it far more consistent. By targeting and untargeting Zelda as you performed the slide down the ramp, you could achieve the correct angle. This eliminated most of the luck and made the technique much more reliant on execution. It was still very difficult though. The targeting basically needed to be frame perfect, and the slide is very hard to maintain under such stressful conditions. Even a decade later, the best runners in the world still only manage to do this maybe 30% of the time on record pace. Back then, the pressure was extremely high, and you have to understand that this is the last difficult part of the run. After the void warp, there is a two minute cutscene where a player could try to settle their nerves, followed by a very simple boss fight. If you did get past the void warp on record pace, you were almost certainly going to get a new record. This is why the reactions from players for many years was so strong wrong at this moment. In 2019, when Torje achieved the first run of under 17 minutes, you can see how much his heart rate spikes after he nails the Void Warp. <laughs> Alright! <laughs> Here we go. There was just always something special about the Void Warp, and whenever I think of Zelda speedruns, it's the first thing I think of. The Wrong Warp is a far more impactful trick, but it was always much easier to do, so it didn't create as much hype and excitement as the Void Warp did. In early 2020, arbitrary code execution was perfected, which meant that players could now warp into the credits without even leaving the starting area of the game. This drastically changed the any% percent category, and obviously meant that the Void Warp was no longer necessary, as you now no longer even fought Ganon or visited his castle. But as is the case with a lot of games, Games, arbitrary code execution tends to not be as popular as the more standard ways of playing, and many players continue to use the old any% percent route, which was now called Defeat Ganon. This new category was basically created to house the now outdated any% percent runs, and was a category for people who still wanted to speedrun the game while still beating the final boss. So while the any% percent speedrun had changed drastically, the Void Warp still lived on in this new category, and was still being used by the top runners. But unfortunately, it would not live forever. Seemingly out of nowhere, a brand new discovery by someone who doesn't even speedrun the game sparked the creation of a strategy that was not only easier, but much faster as well. And thus, the Void Warp was no more. When it comes to skipping the collapse sequence, the Void Warp is the trick that most people know, but it's actually not the only way speedrunners can get to the bottom of the tower. In the category called MST, which means Medallions, Stones, and Trials, runners also use the Wrong Warp from the Deku Tree to Ganon's Castle, just like the old Any% percent Run. However, instead of running through the room and going outside, they use bombs in order to perform a super slide and clip out of bounds. Not only is this faster in general, but it skips the cutscene that plays after you get outside the castle and before the collapse sequence commences. This different collapse skip also uses an acute angle clip, just like the Void Warp, but you wouldn't be able to tell just by looking at where the clip happens. It doesn't look like there is an acute angle corner here to clip through, but if you look closer, you'll notice that the second step does create an acute angle. Now normally, steps don't act like walls. If a wall is short enough, the collision detection won't act like a wall normally would, and Link will just step up onto it. But whether or not a step acts like a wall 
wall isn't dependent on how high it is relative to the floor below, but rather how high it is relative to Link's height on the previous frame. So in this example, if Link is going at a normal speed, he will simply move up each step as he encounters it. However, if he is going so fast that within a single frame he bypasses the first step and hits the second step, this is now high enough to be considered a wall. In that case, the wall collision process will be initiated and Link will be pushed back. In the MST version of the collapse skip, runners can gain enough speed by creating a super slide using multiple bomb explosions. They can use this speed to skip the first step and hit the second step in one frame, which allows the step to act like a wall. Thus, by hitting the second step in the corner, they can create an acute angle clip and get out of bounds. That's all well and good for MST, but why wasn't this done for any percent speedruns? It was used since 2018, well before arbitrary code execution became a thing, and even in the defeat Ganon category, it should still be useful. Well, the obvious problem is that we don't have bombs, which is the way MST runners were getting enough speed to perform the clip. Going out of your way to get bombs would eliminate all of the time gained and more, so it just wasn't used. There was no other known way to get the speed needed. Speed really was the only obstacle to making this trick work, and no one could find a way. There was also this insane setup using bomb chews combined with a jump slash to clip through, but again, getting bomb chews just takes too long. Then, out of nowhere, on the 1st of June 2022, a relatively unknown glitch hunter called Aki posted on his YouTube channel a video titled OOT Navilus Triple Slash Clip. In order to understand the context of this video, we have to learn about the history of the triple slash clip. This is a trick that was first discovered in Ocarina of Time 3D for the 3DS in 2011, literally a week after the game came out. It was found so soon because it uses a new mechanic that didn't exist on the N64 version. In the 3DS version, if you put away your sword after performing a triple slash, it cancels the animation and a link quickly snaps back a pretty large distance. On the N64, putting away your sword doesn't cancel the animation or do anything. In the original video, the uploader showed a clip using the triple slash animation cancel. They wedged themselves into a corner, then while facing away, performed the triple slash cancel, which shoots them back quickly and causes the clip we've talked about before, the acute angle clip. The triple slash animation cancel was just another way to get speed, and a lot of speed at that. The triple slash clip was used everywhere in 3DS, but wasn't usable on the N64 version because they didn't have a way to cancel the slash animation. That is, until 2019, when a way to cancel the triple slash animation was found. The method was to activate a Navi text box. By pressing up C and speaking with Navi during a triple slash, it would cancel the animation and quickly shoot Link backwards. This ended up being used as a way to escape Kokiri Forest early in world record runs. The limitation of this technique is obvious though, as you need to be able to speak with Navi when performing the clip, and this is only possible at certain times throughout the game, or if there is something nearby to interact with. That's where the recent discovery by Aki comes in. Aki realized that if you pulled out a first person item, such as a slingshot, you could cancel the triple slash animation and achieve the same effect. Now, you didn't need to rely on Navi and could perform triple slash clips in any acute angle corner, just like the 3DS version of the game. In Aki's video, he demonstrated the trick in a number of different corners, showing just how easy it was. While Aki wasn't a speedrunner, his channel was full of demonstrations of interesting mechanics, and therefore was followed by several members in the speedrunning community. One such member, Jolin, upon seeing this new triple slash clip, knew immediately where it might be useful. And figuring out if a new trick like this can be used to clip through a corner is relatively simple. First, you figure out how much speed this new trick gives Link. In the case of the triple slash clip, it gives him a speed of 33.5 units per frame. To clip through the corner in Ganon's castle, you need a speed of 31.5 units per frame. 
Thus, it's theoretically possible. When actually applying it to the Defeat Ganon speedrun, there are now just two obstacles. In order to execute this new clip, you need a slingshot to cancel the animation. But in the current route, we don't collect it. Going to get the slingshot would be too slow, just like it was too slow to get bombs. So maybe it's just not viable. However, through an insane series of glitches and coincidences, it is possible to simulate a slingshot by using light arrows. This might seem like useless information because 1. It would take ages to get light arrows normally, 2. You don't have a bow, and 3. Even if you had a bow with light arrows, Child Link can't even equip it. And herein lies the magic of Ocarina of Time speedruns. Getting items in weird ways is already part of the speedrun. In order to do the wrong warp from the Deku Tree to Ganon's castle, we need a bottle. And in previous years, players would get a bottle by going to Kakariko Village and rescuing chickens. But in 2016, an exploitation of a glitch called Get Item Manipulation allowed runners to attain a bottle in the Deku Tree. This glitch is way too convoluted to explain here, but an important thing to note is that as part of the glitch, Link needs to touch a particular chest. Touching this chest changes a value which allows him to get a bottle. And it just so happens that if you perform this exact same glitch, but touch a different chest that is conveniently located nearby, you get light arrows. So all we have to do is the exact same glitch we already use, but to do it twice, once for each chest. So in fact, getting the light arrows doesn't cost too much time. Now, we just have the issue of not having the bow or being able to equip it as a child. Surprisingly, this isn't a huge issue, as to begin with, you don't even need a bow. If you equip light arrows without a bow, you pull out a bow anyway. So that solves that issue. The other problem is not being able to equip the bow as child link. This is also solved pretty easily by doing a trick called Equip Swap. If you try to equip the Light Arrows as Child Link, nothing happens. But if you have the cursor over the Light Arrows, then go to the Equipment screen, then go back and hold a diagonal direction on the control stick towards a different item, and equip it within a single frame, the game will allow you to equip the Light Arrows. Don't ask me why, it just works. However, when the light arrows are equipped, Child Link pulls out the slingshot instead of the bow. So, we have successfully, in the most convoluted way possible, figured out a way to pull out the slingshot without having one. And the time it takes to make it all happen is less than the time saved by the new clip in Ganon's castle, so it ends up saving time overall. So now we should be able to get the triple slash clip to work. All we have to do is wedge ourselves into the corner and do it. But alas, we cannot wedge ourselves into the corner, because as previously mentioned, one of the walls is not a wall, but a stair. And there is also another critical piece of information about the triple slash clip that I have not mentioned. When Link does the triple slash, he moves forward. And even if you do cancel the third slash animation, you don't go backwards further than where you started. So there is obviously something else going on in these clips that sends Link back even further into the wall. And the key is recoil. In these clips, because Link is wedged between two walls, he is striking the walls with his sword with each slash. This propels Link backwards each time, thus keeping him flush in the corner. On the third slash, he hits the walls twice and is kept back instead of moving forwards. So now when he cancels the animation, he is sent even further backwards into the wall behind him. In Ganon's castle, because the corner involves a stair and not a wall, we have to figure out a different way to get the same effect. This same problem had been encountered before in the 3DS version, and the glitch hunter Blenny remembered a tool-assisted speedrun of the 3DS version where they did the triple slash clip, but it wasn't in a corner. To do this, they faced parallel to the wall for the first two slashes. This keeps Link close enough to the wall so that before the third slash they could turn 90 degrees and still be close enough for a clip to work. Jolin had already been working on a setup for the clip in Ganon's castle, and with this extra piece of information, everything fell into place. The original setup by Jolin was a bit difficult to execute, but the speedrunner Lozuts quickly created his own that was far simpler. And the reason a setup is needed is because the angle and position that Link needs to be in to do this clip is very precise, so you couldn't just move into position. You have to start somewhere that you can set the position to be the same every time, and then use specific movements to get him where you need. 
After several days of effort, Lozutz managed to beat the existing world record, which he also held by over 30 seconds. This new trick marks the end of an era, the era of the Void Warp. In a way, it's great that a new strategy has been found, but in another way, it's hard not to acknowledge that with the Void Warp gone, we've lost something special. This new collapse skip is far easier to do, and it's already easier after only a month of being in existence. With more time and more practice, it will become even easier. In the past, everything in the run was leading up to the Void Warp as some kind of dramatic and intense climax. It was so late in the run that the pressure was incredible, and to do it well on record pace was an amazing thing to witness. Now that it's gone, the vibe of the speedrun is totally different. There is no longer that one key moment in the run, and it will be interesting to see how this change affects the psychology of speedrunners. Maybe now, they will be free to take more risks early on because they know that the end is no longer the hardest section. Whatever happens, I know that I will always keep the Void Warp in my memory as a great strategy that brought some of the best moments in speedrunning history. If you have fond memories or even nightmares about the Void Warp, please make sure to share them in the comments. A big thanks to Jolin, Blenny, Lazutz, and Richard Sage for helping me learn about this new strategy. Now, if you want to see this new strategy live in action, I highly recommend you go and follow Richard Sage on Twitch as he is currently trying to reclaim the Defeat Ganon world record. Thank you so much for watching, you legends. I hope you are having a fantastic day, and I will see you in the next video.